been without appearances over the last seven years on A&E, Discovery Channel, Public Broadcasting, Fox FX, The Collectible Shows, History Channel, Learning Channel, and Turner South Network, as well as South Florida's locally based television stations, it would be still safe to say that our speaker today is nationally known as America's foremost authority on the history of transportation to, from, within Florida, as well as on and about the history of the Southeast Florida Gold Coast. A resident of Greater Miami for more than 75 years, he is the senior collector of Florida East Coast Railway, Florida Transportation Memorabilia, Miami Memorabilia, and Floridiana in America, and his FEC Railway and Florida Transportation Memorabilia collection are the largest in the world. They are larger than the State Museum Collection and larger than Flagler's Museum Collection. The founder and current president of the Miami Memorabilia Collector Club, as well as the Greater Miami, North Miami Hot Historical Society, Historical Society Museum, the Gold Coast Steam Railroad, and Fairchild Tropical Gardens, his collection of Miami Memorabilia and Floridiana are the largest in private hands in the country. A graduate of Cornell University, Fame School of Hotel Administration, he holds a master's degree in St. Thomas University and Florida International University, both in Miami. He's adjunct professor of history at Ferry University, where he's historian in residence, as well as adjunct professor of history at Nova Southeastern, adjunct professor of history at Nova Southeastern University, lifelong learning institute, twice honored by FIU. He was presented with the university's torch award, its highest level of my honor in 2008. He's the only person in the country who bears the official title of company historian with an American Railroad in his book, Speedway to Sunshine, the story of Florida East Coast Railway's official history of that famous line. The author of 33 books on South Florida local and Florida transportation history, he is the America's single most published Florida history book author, and he is currently working on number 34, 35, and 36 histories of North Lauderdale and North Miami, as well as the Flagler System Hotels. In addition, he has written almost 400 articles, seven of which have been appeared or refereed or, refer, uh, refereed or jury publications. In much of Florida, he is known as Mr. FEC, and in South Florida, Mr. Miami member of but happily we know him as our friend. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our friend, Mr. FEC himself, Professor Sam Franklin. Oh my God. Did you, did you ever hear anything like that? <laughs> Honest to God, folks. That was so terrific. It sounded like I wrote it myself. <laughs> Which I did. And seriously, that introduction was so wonderful. Ladies and gentlemen, I can't wait to hear what I have to say. <laughs> And what I have to say is this, that our story, our incredible story, begins on January 2nd, 1830, when Reverend Isaac Flagler and his wife had a healthy baby boy in a little place called Hopewell, New York. And to have a baby boy or a baby anything in those days and that winter was an achievement. And the little guy grew, became healthy, but at the age of about 13 or 14, he told his parents that he really, he didn't want to stay. He wanted to move to Michigan to be with his half-brother, Dan Harkness. And Dan's mother and Henry's mother were the same person, but they had different fathers. And so the Flaglers said, well, son, if that's what you want, it's okay. You can certainly do it. And he left, and in those days, you didn't hop on a train and go to Michigan. It was a several-week process because, remember, you had to take canal boats, and you had to take stagecoaches, and it was a long trip. And finally, when he got to Michigan, he was welcomed by the Harkness family. And they thought he was terrific. Uh, Dan had briefed them on his half-brother, Henry. And they put him to work. They gave him a place to live. They put him to work. And they started him off, ladies and gentlemen, at the princely sum of $5 a month. <laughs> a different time, right? And so he loved it. And the trade loved him. What a salesman he was. And by the end of the first six months, he was already making $600 a year. So you can imagine how terrific he was. But it was interesting because the Harknesses had a daughter by the name of Mary. And Henry fell for her hook, line, and sinker. And he pursued her for several years, and finally she agreed to marry him. 
And after they were married, he went to Mr. Harkness, and he had a very good relationship with Mr. Harkness. And he said, I really, I, I, I love it here, but I want to go into my own business. And Mr. Harkness, who treated him like a son, said, son, that's fine. What do you need? He said, well, I need to borrow $30,000. <laughs> now, think about it at that time. Folks, that was a lot of money. When my dad and mom bought our house on Biscayne Point on Miami Beach in 1950, dad paid thirteen nine. <laughs> so you understand what the money situation was and is. At any rate, he borrowed the money, he goes into business, and within six months he lost all of it. <laughs> but unlike today, he paid back every penny. And so he had learned a great deal in the Harkness business, which was grain and rice and dry goods. And he thought that if he went down to a little place which was just beginning to grow, a little place you may have heard, a little place called Cleveland. And he went down to Cleveland with Mary and started a business. And eventually he went all the devices off, please. And he went into the salt business. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you may say, well, what's the big deal about salt? Well, you have to remember, this was pre-refrigeration, wasn't it? Pre-air conditioning, pre-anything that had to do with artificial cooling. And he started making a lot of money because today, even today, much of American salt comes out of northeastern Ohio. I don't know if you're aware of that or not, but a lot of it comes out of northeastern Ohio. And so he is doing very well until one day, one of his young employees comes rushing up to him and says, sir, sir, oh my God, sir, we've got a terrible problem. I don't know, I'm sir. Calm down, young man, tell me what the problem is. Sir, come with me, I'll show you. And he takes him over and he points down and here, bubbling up out of the ground, is this smelly, viscous, dark substance. And Henry turns to him and said, young man, calm down, I will handle it. And handle it he did as he went into the petroleum business. Well, in those days, you had some other fellows in northeastern Ohio who were in that business. A fellow by the name of Samuel Andrews, another guy, what was his, I think, oh, John D. Rockefeller. Yeah. And so they, even then, you had organizations very similar to today's Chambers of Commerce, Boards of Trade, and so they belonged, and they became very friendly. And they decided that what they were going to do, since they got along very well, and rather than, rather than compete, they're going to form a company. And they decided, and I tried to tell them that the name is much too long for the corner covers of the envelopes and the letterheads, but they named it Rockefeller, Andrews, and Flagler anyway. Well, it turned out I was right because about two years later they realized that it was much too long for the letterheads and for the corner covers of the envelopes. And so they said, well, we better change the name. And they did. And that name became the Standard Oil Company. And you know what happened from there. And so it was just absolutely tremendous. The problem was that getting into the late 1870s, the... The late 1870s, the 1880s, Mary was not doing well. Those northern Ohio winters were brutal. And what occurred was that Henry, who still madly in love with Mary, started seeing doctors. And they just didn't know what to do in those days. Consumption, she had consumption, that was the term. And finally, several of the doctors said, look, we've heard about this place. What place? Well, we keep getting told it's where summer spends the winter. <laughs> well, where, where, what is it? We think it's a place called Florida. And so, how do I get there? 
Well, in those days, you could only by rail, with a number of changes, get to a place, the name of which had just been changed right after the Civil War from Cow Ford to Jacksonville. Because why Cow Ford? Because that was the only place where the cattle could cross without drowning across the St. John's River. And so that's how it was called Cow Ford. And he went to Jacksonville. Mary improved, but he didn't like it. The, the hotels were grubby, if you want to call them hotels, grubby little places. And she did improve. They went back to Cleveland. But he didn't come back for two years. When he came back, he went to Orange Park in Clay County, one county west and one county south of Jacksonville. And again, the same thing. She did begin to improve, but by this time, she had a nurse. And the nurse's name was Ida Alice Shorns. And Ida Alice was a very kind woman, a very lovely woman, and she took very good care of Mary. However, Mary died and very sad. But Henry, because Ida Alice had been so good to Mary and so kind, Henry developed this very cordial relationship with then, which then blossomed. And eventually he married Ida Alice. And he decided that he would like to go back to Florida, but not to Jacksonville or to Orange Park. He'll go to St. Augustine. And he went to St. Augustine for the first time, contrary to what you may have heard, in 1878. And when he came down to St. Augustine, he looked around and he said, I like this place. The problem is, there's not a single hostelry or inn for people of my ilk. Now, who were people of his ilk? Well, people with names like Gould, Rockefeller, Belmont, Andrews, that would be Flagler's ilk. People today like Jeff Bezos, right? We know he just bought, the, did you see the two lots? Oh, yeah. Uh, in Indian Creek Village? I don't know if you got to see the USA Today article. Well, guess what? Your new friend Seth is only quoted about eight times. Why? Because one of my books, ladies and gentlemen, as you were told, I've only written 33, none self-published, is titled 33154, the story of Bal Harbor, Bay Harbor Islands, Indian Creek Village, and Surfside. And so USA Today folks call Barry University because they had somehow gotten it. Oh my God, you've got to get a hold of our Professor Gramsis. And there I was, quoted, and it was a terrific article, by the way. I don't know Mr. Bezos, I never met him, but listen, we don't mind people having money. I mean, it's <laughs> and so what occurred was that Henry said, I like this place, but I don't understand why they don't have an inner hostelry for people of my ilk. And he decided that he was going to build the most magnificent resort hotel in the Western Hemisphere. And he got a hold of a famous architectural team, McGuire and McDonald, and put them to work on the Ponce de Leon, today Flagler College. And oh, what a magnificent job they were doing until about Five months into the work, they came to Mr. Flagler and said, Sir, we are sorry to tell you this, but we're going to have to stop construction. He said, what are you talking about? I pay every bill. I pay them immediately. What pay? Sir, sir, please, sir, it's not because you don't pay the bill, sir. This rickety little narrow gauge railroad, the Jacksonville, St. Augustine, and Halifax River that's coming down here from the South Bank, sir, they go off the track every day. It's narrow gauge. They can't carry anything. We, we're losing our shipments almost every day. He said, gentlemen, please calm down. I will go and see Mr. Astor, not John Jacob Astor, by the way, another Mr. Astor. I will talk to him and Mr. Flagman, Mr. Essence, Mr. Flagman, we want you, of course, sir, we'll take care of it. They didn't. And two visits later, Henry Flagler bought lock, stock, and barrel, track, ties, and roadbed, passenger and freight cars, and all locomotives, 
the Jacksonville, St. Augustine, and Halifax River Railroad, and he was in the railroad business. What did he do? He immediately standard gauged the railroad to our standard gauge today, four feet, eight and a half inches. He bought all new equipment. He made plans for a bridge over the St. John's River. And sure enough, the goods began flowing. And at this point, now he's in the railroad business, but he wasn't really a railroad man. And so he reached out to his good friend, Henry Plant. Now, for those of you who are not aware, with our dear friend, Professor Greg Turner, we wrote a book which is titled The Plant System of Railroad Steamships and Hotels. The Plant System was the first great industrial enterprise in the South. And one of my talks, and as you, I think you heard, I give 15 different talks on South Florida local and Florida transportation history. Seven of them are my adult show and tell talks to which I bring the memorabilia. But one of them is titled Florida and the Three Henrys. And the three great Henrys who built Florida. We already named two of them. Anybody want to take a wild guess on who the third Henry was? And his name wasn't Ford. I already named Flagler, didn't I? So how can we name Flagler again? What's that? Who was the second? Plant. Well, I already named two. I keep saying I named two. You named the third, right? Okay, so who was the third? Anybody? Okay, I'm glad you're honest. We ever heard of a place where auto train goes into in the middle of Florida called Sanford? Yeah. Henry Sanford was mm -hmm. President Lincoln's first appointment as an ambassador. He appointed him ambassador to Belgium. Henry Sanford then became Lincoln's man in Europe during the Civil War. And his job in Europe was to sabotage any Confederate ships leaving any port in Europe either by them having an explosion after they left port, or simply having mechanical problems and not being able to get out of port. And Henry Sanford does not get the credit that he deserves for what he did in the American Civil War. Right. So he comes to Florida. Henry Sanford, if you look him up, and please do, what a great name in the history of Florida agriculture. And I will be in a little place the day after Thanksgiving called Hastings, Florida, Florida's potato capital. And I will be giving two talks up there. And of course, they're very familiar with who Sanford was because the Sanford Grant, which is what became Sanford, Florida, was two miles by 14 miles. And that was how it all started. So Florida and the three Henrys, Flagler, Plant, and Sanford. All right? Now, what happened then? Mr. Flagler, and this went off on a tangent because he wasn't really a railroad man. He only bought the railroad so he could get the goods to complete his hotel. He had to hire a railroad. Who does he hire? Joseph R. Parrott. Mr. Parrott had been working for Mr. Plant, and Mr. Parrott was hired by Mr. Flagler. Mr. Plant and Mr. Flagler were good friends. It was an amicable, basically, transfer. Amicable, amicable, whichever word you like. <laughs> and so Mr. Parrott comes over. They hit it off immediately. And within a few months, Mr. Parrott is running the railroad, but they became friends. They would walk around St. Augustine. And at some point, Mr. Parrott, looking at the empty space across the street, across King Street, from the Ponce de Leon, said to Mr. Flagler, you know, sir, I wonder if you would consider building another hotel right here, because after all, we are going to control people coming on vacation who can pay, ready, 13 and $14 a night. <laughs> but what about all those people that can't quite afford 13 and $14 a night, but can afford 11 or $12 a night? Maybe, he said, that's an excellent idea. So he wound up building the Alcazar. And then there was another hotel under construction, the Casa Monica. And the same conversation, how about people who can only afford nine or ten dollars a night. And pretty soon Henry Flagler had the three hotels in St. Augustine. So at this point, at this point, the season comes to an end. Now, understand that the 1887-88 season was the beginning of the great seasonal Florida years. And what happened that helped to make it so important? 
You may have heard of a little railroad called the Pennsylvania Railroad, the Atlantic Coastline Railroad, and the partner later would be the Florida East Coast Railroad. And so what occurred was that Mr. Flagler, the people at the Pennsylvania, the people at Atlantic Coastline said, you know, it's time if we're going to bring people to this magnificent hotel and hotels, we need to upgrade the service. And so they came up with, ladies and gentlemen, the very first fully articulated, fully electrically lighted passenger train in American history, the New York and Florida Special. And that train had people just like when the first 747 took off, and just when the first supersonic track, people lining the tracks all night long to see this incredible marvel of technology go by, electrically lighted vestibule. You didn't have to jump across from car to car in the open weather. It was fantastic. What a great season. And at the end of the season, Mr. Flagler is in his office, and two young men are shown into his office, and it turns out to be John Anderson and James Price. And if you're ever driving on US-1, you will, up, up the road a piece towards Ormond, you will see the sign that says John Anderson Highway. It should say John Anderson and James Price Highway, all right? But, who they? Well, let me tell you who they is. Because, ladies and gentlemen, John Anderson and James Price had built a beautiful hotel in a little place called Ormond. And they called it the Ormond Hotel. And they were ushered in to see Mr. Flagler. And he said, gentlemen, how may I help you? Well, sir, you may have heard we built this beautiful hotel about 90 miles south of here at Ormond Beach, which is just north of Daytona Beach. Maybe it's not 90, whatever the mileage is. And sir, we thought you were going to extend your railroad down to Ormond. And Mr. Flagler looked at them, and they said, and sir, where you had this wonderful season, all three hotels filled the whole season, sir, we had less than 100 room nights for the entire season. And for those of you not familiar with the hospitality business, that means one person staying in one room under times. Imagine how terrible the season was for them. And he said, he, Mr. Flagler, said, well, gentlemen, what, what do you expect of me? Well, sir, we're hoping that by next season you will extend the railroad down to Ormond. And he said, well, let Mr. Parrott and I come down. We'll look at the hotel, and I'll make a decision. And so, wonderful. So Mr. Flagler, with Joseph R. Parrott, comes down to Ormond, and... Mr. Flagler said to Mr. Orman, wait here for me, please. I'm Mr. Orman, to Mr. Parrott. And he goes into the hotel, and for almost three hours, he walks around the hotel. He's opening closet doors. He's looking in pantries. He's looking in guest rooms. He's looking and looking. Comes down, calls Mr. Parrott aside, whispers something. Mr. Parrott turns to Anderson and Price, and gentlemen, Mr. Flagler said to tell you, we will be in touch. <laughs> Well, two days later, they get a telegram. You remember those things, don't you, telegrams? <laughs> they get a telegram, and the telegram says, please arrange, come to St. Augustine expeditiously as possible, Joseph R. Parrott. And two days later, they're ushered into Mr. Flagler's office. And Mr. Flagler greets them, stands up behind the desk, and says, gentlemen, I have come to a decision. And you say to me, Seth, how do you know what he said? Because, ladies and gentlemen, remember, <laughs> As our former president, not the guy in the White House, our former president of the FEC Railway, used to like to come down to the Smyrna to introduce me. And he would hold up one finger, not this one, this one. And he would say, I want you all to know that Seth is number one. And everybody's looking at him. What the hell does that mean? And then he would say, Seth is number one in a field of one, <laughs> because I'm the only person in the country who bears the official title of company historian with an American railroad. And so we have the documents. I'm the one who preserved most of what we had in our Miller shops in St. Augustine, in our headquarters in St. Augustine, including this fellow here. That's the original portrait that hung in our, our headquarters in St. Augustine for 80, 90 years, whatever it was. 
and I was asked to preserve it. So if you ever want to come down to Miami and see the Bramson Archive, just let me know. We'd be delighted to show you all the junk. That's J-U-N-Q-U-E. Yeah. Okay. So at any rate, Mr. Flagler says, I've come to a decision, and they're on pins and needles. He said, gentlemen, I will buy the hotel and extend my railroad to Ormond, but only if you sell me the hotel. And they did. And they remained with Mr. Flagler for close to 30 years operating the Ormond Hotel. Well, once he got down to Ormond, he realized that there were some great opportunities a little bit further south. And so he decides that he wants to see this place that's budding on the Lower East Coast. And he has a map larger than this one. This is only the 1926 issue. In his office. And he circles this place here called West Palm Beach. And he said, gentlemen, or he said to Mr. Parrott, Mr. Parrott, uh, and by this time he had John, uh, um, James Abraham as Ingram Building in downtown Miami as his land commissioner. And so he had the two of them in his office. He said, gentlemen, I want you to make arrangements for us to go down to this place. And they looked at each other. It's like wilderness. Well, they went down. And how'd they get there south of the railroad? By boat, by buckboard. And they got down to the place, and there is this crummy little inn called the Palm Beach Inn may have heard later it became a place called the Breakers. And this crummy little place and on the Palm Beach side. And Mr. Flagler said to uh, Mr. Ingram, Mr. Parrott, gentlemen, please wait for me up here on this porch. And he disappeared into the wilderness, and it was wilderness. And after two and a half hours, they really became frantic. They were gonna call whoever they could call. And he bounds out of the wilderness, and he said, gentlemen, you will kindly make arrangements for us to buy this place. And he bought it. And he extended the railroad to West Palm Beach and Palm Beach, where he bought this little place, built the first breakers after the 1908 fire, built the second breakers, and the Royal Point Sienna, the magnificent wooden hotel facing Lake Worth. So the railroad at this point is extended down to West Palm Beach. And that's it. Folks, the story's over. <laughs> oh no, it's not over? You mean there's more? Yes. <laughs> yeah, it appears there is because contrary to, and I don't know how many of you speak French, but contrary to the bubabices, <laughs> the fables, the nonsense, the falderal that you may have heard, oh, and by the way, one of my talks is titled Debunking the South Florida myths. And the myth I start with is, oh, Julia Tuttle sent Mr. Flagler some orange blossoms. So he extended the railroad to this game. How'd she send it? By FedEx? <laughs> By postal service overnight? Nonsense. She never sent anything. It's a fable and a story that was concocted years ago. Because what really and truly and actually happened was that you may have heard the great and terrible freezes of December of 1894 and January and February of 1895. Now, before those freezes, a couple by the name of Mary and William Brickle had already started writing to Mr. Flagler, and folks, just so you know that I can back up all the hot air, understand that some years ago I was given the opportunity, and this man over here was with me. I'm gonna introduce him in a moment, because he deserves introduction. I bought the William and Mary Brickle collection. This young fellow helped me load it. And by the way, how many of you listen to a wonderful radio station called WLRN, National Public Radio, in Miami? And 91.3 on your FM dial. And the longest running radio program in the state of Florida's history. Every Sunday night from 8 to midnight, night train with Ted Grossman, ladies and gentlemen, my friend, Ted Grossman. And so, Mr. Flagler is getting letters from the Brickles. See, the Brickles 
Some years ago, I bought the massive collection of William and George Gleason and their partner, William Hunt. And who was Gleason? He was a carpetbagger and a scallywag that came to Florida after the Civil War, became a lieutenant governor, eventually moved to South Florida, founded a place called, which he called Biscayne, Florida. That today is called Miami Shores. All right? And we have the Gleason collection. As the expression goes, in terms of the massiveness of that one alone, don't ask. And so he came after the Civil War. But through buying his collection, we have the two oldest pieces known to exist from with the name Miami and the name Dade County. Dade County, the 1878 Revenue Collector's Book, the Tax Collector's Book, a total of 32 families in what was then Dade, remember Dade County, half of today's do, uh, uh, Palm, uh, Monroe, all of Dade, all of Broward, all of Palm Beach County, plus Martin County. That was the size of Dade County at the time. 32 families lived here. And among those families were the Sturtevants, the Sturtevants, Julia Tuggle's parents. But Julia wasn't here. The Brickles were here. They're in the book. So Julia didn't come till 1888, all right? And so we know who was here. And what occurred was that Mr. and Mrs. Brickle had first started sending letters asking Mr. Plant to extend his railroad. They wrote eight letters to Henry Plant asking him to extend his railroad. And finally, with the eighth letter, and yes, we have the facts on this, he wrote back. He was a prodigious letter writer. You may have heard the story when our great Florida U.S. Senator, um, what was his name? Uh, the first U.S. Senator from Florida, first U.S. Senator was Jewish. I'm having a junior moment. I just can't think. Uh, uh, David, David Levy. David Levy Uli. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, he, and the story where, where he cut off Levy's railroad because Levy never answered his letters. But why am I telling you that? Because he was a prodigious letter writer. He answered every one of the Brickle's letters, and finally with the eighth letter, he wrote back and he said, my dear madam, kindly cease and desist from contacting me. I have no intention of extending my railroad 160 miles across trackless wilderness to satisfy your ego. And that's what he said on the letter. Didn't bother her in the least. Why? Because her salvation was right there in Palm Beach. And so she began writing to Mr. Flack. Julia didn't get here until 1888. Then she began writing. And then, of course, we have the great and terrible freezes of December of 1894. You can see we're making progress. <laughs> December of 1894 and January and February of 1895. And it was these great and terrible freezes that enabled so much to happen following. As I explained to my students, the two single most important years in the history of South Florida, 1896 and 1926. And that's another story for another time. But suffice to say that eventually the Brickles offered Mr. Flagler, if you will extend your railroad to the shores of Biscayne Bay, half of our holdings south of the river, Miami River. Julia offered half of her holdings north of the river, plus 50 acres for shops and yards. All right? With that, contracts were drawn up, signed by all appropriate parties, and the deal was made. Well, there's only one thing. You have to remember that in those days, the state of Florida, for each mile of railroad extended, would give a section on either side of the track. How big is a section? 640 acres. And so the railroads were getting alternate sections. Now, Mr. Flagler, at this point, said to Mr. Ingram, his land commissioner, he said, Mr. Ingram, I want you to call on any of those folks that own property in which, on which our railroad has to cross and arrange for them to donate the land for the right of way. And Mr. Ingram turned to Mr. Flagler and said, sir, I will have no problem doing that, but let me ask you something. What if the party involved says, yes, I will donate my land, but you have to build me a station? And Mr. Flagler said, you just go ahead and tell them we will be happy to build them a station. 
we won't stop any trains there, but we'll build one station. <laughs> and so that was how it came to be. And so, as we know, in contrary to what certain people have wrote, <coughs> the official date for the FEC Railway's arrival in Miami is April 15th, 1896. All right? And remember what I told you, one of the two most important years in the history. And we could go through the, the list, but suffice to say that one of my books is titled La Chaim, The History of the Jewish Community of Greater Miami. And the book is dedicated to the Cohen family, Ida and Isidore Cohen, the first chapter titled Ida and Isidore Cohen. And Mr. Cohen's wife, who her first husband passed away, uh, he went up to New York ostensibly on a buying trip uh, after Mrs. Schneidman went back to New York, brought her back, and when he brought her back, she was Mrs. Cohen, <laughs> with the two children adopted by him, and then they had the daughter, Claire Cohen Weintraub, and oh my God, what a story. Why am I telling you that? Because you hear this nonsense, again, these fables, oh, Mr. Flagler was an anti-Semite. No, he wasn't. That is pure, unadulterated nonsense. And I won't go into the whole story, except to tell you that we can back it up, all right? And so the railroad arrives April 15th, 1896, and that's the beginning because on July 22nd, 1896, Miami comes into existence as a city. And at this point, the railroad begins to grow, but Mr. Flagler realizes that we've got to get to the great growing area south of Miami. So the railroad is extended 12 miles south of the Miami River. And at that point, it looks like from stop, but as you may have heard the story, and this is another one of my debunking the myths, the United States government agreed to complete the Panama Canal. Now, folks, you know we love to rag on the French, don't we? And most of the time, deservedly so. But one thing you learn from me is, folks, I'm going to tell the truth and I'm going to state the facts. And I won't put up with the nonsense spouted by, among others, Miami's walking fountain of misinformation on his walking tours, no matter whether it's Homestead, South Miami, North Miami, Miami Beach, Carl Gables. He brings the group together. He looks around. He points at a building and he whispers conspiratorially, that was Al Capone's hideaway. <laughs> Al Capone didn't have any hideaways. He had a house on Palm Island, Miami Beach. Okay? So we tell the story, the truth and the facts. Folks, if we had tried to build the Panama Canal when the French, we would have failed also. Because we could not complete, we could not even start it until we figured out that what was killing the men was the malaria and the yellow fever. Thanks to Colonel De Lesseps and Walter Reed, we were able to figure that out, to save the men, and to complete the canal. But while this is going on, Mr. Flagler, and again, this nonsense, oh, Flagler's folly. Oh, oh, he lost money on the Key West. Oh, please, you come, people come up with this. Don't get me started. <laughs> Folks, the Key West Extension. There's a little book. In fact, we have it here, I think, yeah. It's called The Greatest Railroad Story Ever Told. Henry Flagler and the Florida East Coast Railway's Key West Extension. And my dear friends, I can introduce you to the author if you like. <laughs> I'm standing here, what do you want me to tell you? It was very simple. After the studies were done, because the original plan was for the railroad to be extended from somewhere in South Dade across <coughs> the Everglades to a place called Cape Sable. Flamingo today, right? And so Mr. Flagler sent his assistant chief engineer, fellow by the name of William J. Crone. And he sent Mr. Crone on a survey. Mr. Crone came back and said, Mr. Flagler, I, I just don't think it will do another survey. The people in Key West went wild. Oh my God, we can do, we can get him, we can convince him. And they did. But contrary to other things you may have heard, especially, uh, um, 
when an, an article appeared in De Cuesta, the journal of the Historical Association of Southern Florida, uh, written by one of the fellows who was an engineer on the extension, and he wrote that when Mr. Chrome came back from the second uh, survey, the people in Key West were going wild. We are going Mr. Flagler said to Mr. Chrome, I want you to survey a route to Key West. He surveyed a route to Key West, and he came back. Mr. Flagler said, well, Mr. Chrome, what do you have to tell me? Mr. Chrome said, sir, it will be difficult, but it can be done. Contrary to what my good, close, personal friend, as Neil Rogers would have said, what's his name, wrote, folks, Mr. Flagler did not say, well, go ahead then, because if you look at this book, you will see the receipts for the trip that he made in one of his own chartered steamships to go down and to check the route and see if it was feasible. And it was feasible. And so the construction began in 1904, completed in 1912, and you may have seen the pictures, you may have heard the story. Mr. Flagler arrived in Key West on the first of five trains that day to come down into Key West. And he was 82 years old. He was going blind, having problems with the hearing. And he turned to the mayor as they were escorting him from the train. He <coughs> said to the mayor and the admiral, he said, I can, I can hear, I can see the children, but I can't hear them singing. And everybody had a grand time, came back to Palm Beach, where, and we told you about Ida Ellis, Ida Alice, today there are terms for that, those kind of mental issues, uh, and she had them, and so he had her committed. And in those days, Florida did not allow divorce for almost any reason, including the mental incompetence of a spouse. And Mr. Flagler sent Mr. Crone and Mr. Parrott to the state legislature. He said, I want you to meet with them, I want you to talk to them, I want you to explain why the law needs to be changed. Sounds like today. Right? <laughs> and they went and spoke to state legislature, and incredibly, the state legislature made mental incompetence of the spouse a legal reason for divorce. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Crone divorced Ida Alice, paying for her care the rest of her life, and about three months after the state legislature changed the law, they changed it back. <laughs> but... Mr. Flagler had met Mary Lily Keenan from the Keenan Company of North Carolina. And eventually he married Mary Lily, and it was because of her urging that he built the great mansion Whitehall in Palm Beach, which some of you have been to. I'm going to get to that in a moment. So Mr. Flagler comes back. He's in fairly good health, and he's living in Whitehall. And contrary to what you may have heard, because if you go to Whitehall, they'll point at the grand staircase, the marble staircase, and they'll say, this is where Mr. Flagler fell and broke his hip, leading to his death. And I don't know if you've heard that. No. Nonsense. If you ever go on the tour and they say that, say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Show us the private staircase, and to the left of the grand staircase, there's a door. It's kept locked. There's a staircase under the main staircase because Mr. Flagler did not want to come down on the grand staircase and be rushed by the people at Mary Lily's party. So he would come down the small staircase, private staircase. That's where he fell and broke his hip. And Henry Flagler would go on from March until May 20th, 1913 and he would die on May 20th, 1913. Now, sadly to report, my wife of many years passed away uh, a couple of months ago, but I mention this because Henry Flagler died on May 20th, and I used to like to say that I was married, you ready? To the reincarnation of Henry Flagler. <laughs> but Seth, how could that be? Because ladies and gentlemen, Myrna was born on May 20th, oh, not 1913. <laughs> so, at any rate, things continued, the railroad continued, we go into US-1, and then we come into the 1920s. The great Florida boom of the 1920s. We double-tracked the railroad. 
we built new stations and cooperating with Mr. Young, one of the two greatest architectural crimes in the history of the state of Florida was the tearing down of this magnificent building and our station in Daytona Beach. Neither of them by the railroad, by the way, by the, I gotta be careful, by the cities involved, but not by the railroad, all right? So we go into the 1920s, we double track the railroad. We buy all new passenger and freight cars, all new locomotives, all devices put away, please, and turned off, please. And so, ladies and gentlemen, it's a whole new railroad until 1926, when the five terrible events occur. The last of the five was the great and terrible hurricane of September 17th and 18th, 1926. And let me explain to you that the Key West extension was never a folly. Some genius not wrote something. Flagler's folly, Flagler's folly. The only folly was writing a book by that title or an article because it made money for many years. But listen, come the Depression. We go into the Depression, 1920. Well, you understand, and I want you to understand that the Great Depression actually had its beginnings right here in South Florida. You say, but how could that be so? We've always heard the stock market. Yeah, but listen carefully, please. <clears throat> because remember, the great American boom of the 1920s began here. It began here. The five terrible events of 1926, culminating with the hurricane, September 17th and 18th, 19, 1926, which killed over 600 people, not 200, 600. Mm -hmm. Folks, those five terrible events of 1926 were the harbinger or harbinger of the Great Depression that would start with the stock market crash in 1929. In 1931, we went for bankruptcy. Receivership, trusteeship, and operated in receivership and trusteeship until 19, January 1st, 1961. In the meantime, you may have heard of the terrible September 2nd, 1935 hurricane. And it was that hurricane that destroyed 40 miles of the Key West Extension. And people have said, well, Seth, why didn't we rebuild? Because we were in bankruptcy. Traffic was down to an all-time low, where we had had three and four passenger trains a day. We were operating one a day. And where we had two freight trains every day, seven days a week, we were operating one 15 to 20 car freight train three or four days a week. And so with us in bankruptcy, with business at an all time low, there was no way to rebuild, all right? That simple. So as I told you, we came out of bankruptcy 1961, uh, January 1st, under the aegis of the Florida DuPont estate. Well, things have changed. We have rebuilt ourselves a number of times. Uh, we are considered the highest speed rail operation in the country. And you may have seen some of our trains go, and I'm not talking about dumb line, oh, sorry, bright line. Uh, we have our trains going by at 55 and 60 miles an hour, the great freight trains. And so it is an incredible story, ladies and gentlemen. It's an absolutely incredible story. I do give a separate talk on the history of Key West Extension, by the way. But there is no story like our story. We are now owned by Grupo Mexico. And we are now in a situation in which we are one of the most respected railroads in America, top-notch operation, top-notch management, and again, the only railroad in the United States with an officially titled company historian. Mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been a great pleasure. I'm honored to have been with you. Thank you all. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, unaccustomed as I am to public speaking, uh, I would be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Sir? Uh, coal. How do you get enough coal down to South Florida to keep these local Because, people? and remember that we switched over to oil right after, right, we, we started it during the uh, war, uh, during the first world war to oil. And we brought in coal from wherever the coal was mined, West Virginia, Kentucky, anywhere, and then it came into Jacksonville, 
and then was brought to wherever we needed it. But like any place else, in the hopper cars and brought down, and then with the switch over to uh, fuel oil, uh, running our steam engines with fuel oil, and then later on, of course, with the diesel locomotives. So thank you for asking. Yes, sir. Uh, so when the passenger service stops on the FEC, and all the stations that were handling the passengers, did they get turned over to the city? Is that how this travesty started? No. How no. did the city get control of them? Thank you. Great question. Uh, keep in mind that because the non-operating unions, the unions that did not operate the trains, demanded a 10.63 cent an hour wage increase shortly after we came out of bankruptcy. And we met, we, our management, met with the non-operating unions 32 times. And on the 32nd meeting, our management, Mr. Wyckoff, Mr. Thornton, said to the unions, look, we can't give you 10.63 cents an hour, we're just out of bankruptcy. We'll give you more than that, we'll give you four cents an hour now, four cents an hour in six months and four cents an hour, and the union said, no, we're not gonna take you, you have to go with the national settlement. And so our people walked out on January 22nd, 1963. Now, what happened? We did not operate passenger train service until the first train operated in 1965. I should remember because I was on the front cover of the Miami Herald the next day carrying the sign that said, welcome back, we missed you, uh, August 2nd, 1965. And so from August 2nd, 1965 to July 30th, 1968, we operated one passenger train a day between North Miami and Jacksonville. Mm -hmm. Now, stations, some of them we maintained as offices, some of them we torn down, we tore down, but several others, the cities came in and said, well, they're, they're big, not being used and they're eyesores, which they weren't. One of the worst crimes of all was tearing down a Miami station. I mean, imagine what a great historic museum that could have been. But, you know, so I hope that answers the question. Uh, yes, ma'am. Like you said, he couldn't build anymore on the uh, railroad. Did anything happen to change? No, when you say that I said he couldn't build anymore on I'm not sure what you're referring to. Please help me. Well, I'm trying to say that he couldn't go any farther than West Palm Beach. Oh, well, yes, uh, everything changed that. What changed that was remember that you had the terrible. Uh, winter of December of 1894 and January, February of 1895. And because the winter was so bad, that's when Mr. and Mrs. Rickle and Mrs. Puddles really went after him with their letters to extend the railroad. And when Mr. Ingram and Mr. Parrott came down, because Mr. Flagler said, you must see if they're telling the truth. Region around shores of Biscayne Bay, untouched by the freezes. And Mr. Ingram and Mr. Parrott came down they could only get to West Palm Beach by train, and in West Palm Beach, they had to come down by boat and by buckboard. When they crossed the freeze line, now this is important, you've heard of the freeze line. Nobody knows where the freeze line was, but ladies and gentlemen, I'm gonna tell you, I appear to have been the closest. That's the best way I can phrase it. Because the freeze line from everything I've studied read appears to have been, notice those words, I'm being careful, and it's quite a distance between two miles north and two miles south of today's Broward Boulevard. That's, and once they crossed the freeze line, and they reported to us everything was dead and dying, turning black, falling off the tree. Once they, everything was lush and verdant and green. And that's what they reported back to Mr. Flagler. So yes, that was when the decision was extend south from West Palm Beach and Miami. Yes, ma'am. Uh, why is it that you hardly ever hear about Mr. Flag, where anybody knows Mr. Rockefeller, that artist of standard oil? Why, why is that? Because just he was more well known than Well, I'm going to respectfully, respectfully say to you that, as the late great Neil Rogers would have said, my good close personal friend, what's his name? Mm -hmm. Yes, we know the name Rockefeller, and Mr. Flagler's name should have been nationally as almost as big, yeah. but it was, but here in Florida, that's the man. It is. So, right. Not nationally. Yeah, but not nationally yet. I'm doing the best I can. Uh, yes, sir. Well, might you please touch how we got from the decision not to go through the Everglades to the Car and Sound Railway to uh, overseas from Key Largo down to Yes, a uh, very good question. Uh, one of the stories told by somebody in Isla Morada 
and I'm not going to mention names, heaven forbid, <laughs> the late so-and-so. Oh, Mr. Flagler was going to build out the Cape Sand. I built a causeway across Florida Bay. And I, what? The hell did you get that? Once the decision was made that it was going to be impossible to go across the Everglades, then the surveys were made. Mr. Crone did the survey. Mr. Flagler came down on the chartered ship to make sure that everything was the way Mr. Crone had said it was. And that's when they made the decision. Because remember, Key West, for many years, was the largest city in Florida. Key West had the liqueurs and liquor industry. They had the tobacco industry. So they did a lot of business in Key West. So that was why I hope that answered the question. Hey. Yes, sir. Uh, somebody else over here? Yes, ma'am. Um, I was just wondering, do you... Um, a little louder, please. I'm sorry. Uh, so many things that Mr. Young built are being torn down in Hollywood, and uh, it looks to me like the Hollywood Beach Resort is next. I was wondering if you know anything about what the demise of that building will be built in 1925? Well, let me um, let me answer that this way, ladies and gentlemen. I should have brought it. I did know with 33 books. I can't remember, you know, this... It's getting old stuff. It's getting to me. I can't remember everything. <laughs> Well, one of my books, if you look me up and you find out I can back up all the hot air, is titled Broward County. And that book in 2018 was named the Broward County Book of the Year by the Broward County Commission. The problem we are having is that magnificent edifices such as the Hollywood Beach Hotel, which should be saved. And then you have these morons in Miami, we, could, we, could, we got to save the Dopeville Hotel. What? It's a monolith. There's nothing architecturally historic about it. it was torn down. Mr. Ross did the right thing. Where were they to save the Roney Plaza? Where were they to save the Gulfstream Hotel? Where were they to save the old Miami Herald building at 200 South Miami yeah. Avenue? Because they're front-running phonies. That's what. And folks, that building should be saved. It's the old problem, the same as it was with the Doville. These people, oh, they want to save the Doville. So why don't you put up the money to save the Doville? I didn't, I didn't see anybody putting it was it was in such rotten condition but i think that i would love to see that i just don't have the money to put up so I, I can answer that question yes sir I, our mr president the uh, hollywood beach hotel is a big question mark right now and a lot of people are asking what is going on with it but it was a very difficult property ownership the property has been broken up so many different entities that it was completely impossible to get control Champlain Tower collapsed and the home holdout started to get worried because the building is almost 100 years old. It has never had a 40 year inspection. And it has been remodernized so many times through the Van Toven ownership when they turned it into a convention hotel, they got it and did stuff, and then the Bible College and Ocean Walk. Um, and they were nervous. So they there's an entity, Chief Reed, it's no secret, Jonathan Chief Reed, they're billionaire developers out of New York, have assumed control of the building. They now control it. And they're antsy to do something. And what that is, we're still waiting. But word on the street is they want to preserve the entire facade. And if it can't be preserved, recreate it. Recreate the entire front of the hotel. But of course, they're going to want some sort of new component in that. Sure. And I don't know how high that's going to be or how tough the city will be when this comes to the city because it's a 65 height ordinance right now. 65 feet. That's not that high, but they're going to want much more than that. Right. They may be able to get some something. Like we realize you're going to need something new, but we don't want to look at a 30-story tower at the foot of Hollywood Bricks. This will also entail the biggest mistake that ever happened to the Hollywood Beach Hotel, the ranch. When they put that ramp there, you just stuck a, a knife into the heart of that historic front. They want to get rid of that ramp, Thank you. which will bring back the front garden. So I'm slightly optimistic. I would be sad if we lost the entire structure, but if they rebuilt it like the Great Summer. I mean, if you go down Hollywood Boulevard, you look at the Great Summer right now, It is you don't know that you're not looking at the building. Yeah, so great. I'm not totally against that here. Yeah, look at the Young House, though. I drove by that recently last week. 55 Hollywood Boulevard, right. just like the day it was built. It's a private ownership. Right. It's on the National Register of Historic Places. The first one in Hollywood. I'm sorry to take over your question. Yes, <laughs> man. Take your time, but hurry. It's <laughs> <laughs> not easy. Uh, but that, that house, if you look at it today, I mean, you look at the postcard from the 20s, they have the images of it. Any, yes, question here, sir. Yeah, I didn't want to say that you know, we've been talking about it, the passenger railroad. When you look from the 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, 2010s, 
awesome. The railroad was a freight railroad making magnificent money and building Florida. We moved so much stone from South Florida to Central Florida, North Florida, you just wouldn't believe that South Florida and the FEC Railroad built so much of Central Florida and North Florida. It's the highest quality stone in the state comes out of South Florida and it's distributed by the FEC Railroad. I'm going, to ask you, I'm going to ask you to make one respectful correction. We are and have always been known as Florida East Coast Railway. So we want to say I understand. Thank you. Thank you. I love it. Well, folks, yes, sir. You have a quick question? I put that best position. I've heard of a couple of the AV, uh, and several times here, and every time you need a different fact. And the graduate of Miami Beach Island, he's got more cars to ride sell at his house if you're interested. Do you, do you hear that word, Kazurai? Yeah. That means high quality junk. J U N Q U E. Ladies and gentlemen, be well. We're going to have to wrap this up until we start winning tickets. If anybody want to buy a last minute raffle ticket, we'll be happy to take your money.